Hi, everyone. How's it going? Woo! <laughs> uh, so as you guys settle in, uh, feel free to add me on Twitter uh, in case I can't get to the questions at the end or if you think of anything after the talk. Uh, but let's get started. So my name is Sean. I work at Riot Games, and I'm on the Insights Tech team, which is our big data team. And the project I work on is our in-house ETL tool, which is really fun because it can uh, touch all the data that comes into our data warehouse. Uh, but I'm not really going to talk about that too much today. Uh, it plays a little part of the story. But uh, before I go on to the next slide, uh, my roommate told me this morning that uh, I talk in my sleep. So specifically, he said I was giving this talk in my sleep. So hopefully, conscious Sean can give a better talk than unconscious Sean. Um, you're welcome to my room later tonight if you want to hear that version of the talk. So uh, what I'm actually here to talk about today is uh, how our data team moved from our data center into AWS. Uh, we studied a bunch of reasons uh, why we wanted to make that transition, and then we came to the decision to pull the trigger and do it. But uh, we didn't do it right the first time. Uh, I come here humbly before you to talk about several mistakes that we made along the way. And my hope is, while you're watching this talk, our pain will help you so that you can avoid the mistakes that we've made and so that you can take that information when you're moving to AWS. Uh, finally, you know, once we, were, once we got everything working, we got a ton of cool new features that we could translate into features for our players and other teams within Riot. So let's get started. Uh, if you haven't heard of Riot Games before, we are the makers of League of Legends. And League of Legends is a PC or Mac game that was launched in 2009. Uh, it's online, so you can play with your friends or complete strangers. And uh, each game stands alone and lasts about 40 to 50 minutes uh, in length. Uh, the, the game involves uh, two teams battling for control on a map. And essentially, at the beginning, you choose a champion, then you team up with four other people, and you try and destroy their base before they destroy yours. And it's very complicated. There's a lot of data that transfers back and forth between the clients and the servers, uh, like spell casts, deaths, purchases, things like that. And games go on for 50 minutes long. So we collect a lot of data about this game. Uh, the, uh, essentially, in any given day, we'll collect around 12 billion game-related events. So these are essentially any time someone dies, any time you choose a champion or cast a spell or anything like that. And uh, in addition to this, we also collect a ton of telemetry data about our servers. So uh, how can we debug this uh, game client over here? Well, we can collect all of the logs from that and look at it in our data warehouse. And overall, this is about, translates to about 50 terabytes a day that we ingest of uncompressed data. Uh, since 2009, this amounts to a total of about 26 petabytes of data. So you might be asking, what do we do with all of this data, right? So Riot Games aspires to be the most player-focused game company in the world. But in order to understand our players, how they use the games, uh, their desires, uh, things like that, we need to understand uh, how they're interacting with the tools. And we can do that with data. So the Insights Tech team is basically focused on allowing our decision makers at Riot to make data-informed design decisions about our game using a lot of this data. So why did we want to move, right? Well, before we uh, get 
into this directly. Let's take a look at what our ecosystem looked like in around 2011, 2012. At that time, we were an international game. We were lucky enough that word of mouth spread across the world. And uh, we had uh, several data centers that were piping data into our centralized data warehouse here in the United States. So the red icon is where our data warehouse was, and the gray ones are different data centers. So let's look at one of these data centers, right? This is very uh, a common architecture for any scalable system that you'll see. You'll have uh, a, a large number of uh, application servers, or we call them game servers, because our application is a game. And uh, players interact with these game servers through the client and uh, through a series of load balancers and firewalls. And all of the data gets stored locally in MySQL databases in that data center. But as our great game grew, we had more people joining and playing on our servers, which means we wanted to ensure that there wasn't lag, latency, and just a general good performance for our players. So we had to scale out horizontally and add more game servers. So all of these new players were generating a ton of new data. And our infrastructure team was racking servers at breakneck pace, right? Their hands were full. Now you take this growth and you amplify it because not only was each data center growing, the players in each location were playing more games, but we were adding new data centers. And today, League of Legends is played in every continent except for Antarctica. <laughs> so uh, our, our infrastructure team was really busy. And so now let's zoom in on what our data center looked like, our data warehouse uh, infrastructure looked like. So in order to support all of this data, we had a 30-node Hadoop cluster uh, running on Cloudera uh, distribution. And it was essentially getting, uh, all the data was uh, injected using Scoop and Uzi. So we had these ETL jobs running and pulling from all of the different MySQL data warehouses, or My MySQL databases, and putting them into our Hadoop cluster. Uh, these 30 Hadoop nodes essentially had a 250 terabyte capacity, and w it was getting full, right? We were drinking data out of a fire hose, and it got to a point where in order to accept more data into this uh, 30 Hadoop cluster, we, we actually needed to reduce the replication factor of the data, right? So we went from three copies of the data down to two, which is like risky, right? There's a chance that you are going to lose data. Uh, and when you are forced to make this decision of potentially losing data in order to take in more data, you wanna consider a more scalable system than what you currently have now. So one of the things that's really cool about working at Riot is that we saw that our infrastructure team was overloaded and we wanted to enable them to continue to have focus on the players and having good performance directly for them. So we wanted to, to help offload their work, we wanted to own our own infrastructure. And this helped unblock us and it helped uh, support their like focus on creating new data centers and racking new servers. So that was one reason we wanted to move. Another reason that we wanted to move was, so our primary data warehouse was queried by the analyst through Hive. And we had a lot of data contention. So we had data analysts, we had data scientists, we had our ETL tool running and loading data through that. And we had our visualization tools. And at the time, we were running Hive version 0.08. So this is a very old version. This was before Yarn. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with Yarn, that is a, a sort of hardware resource management tool. And so 
the, if, if there was a, a, a situation where an analyst would take over an entire cluster with an intense query, then the other people would be affected, right? So an example of this, right, is a, let me tell you a little story, is we had uh, this young, naive, young, wonderful analyst who just got hired, and he was tasked with finding uh, aggregate creating an aggregate report of all of the store purchases in our ecosystem. So he's not super familiar with Hive. You know, he's a statistics wizard. He's an Excel wizard. He sits down. He's, he's like at the Hive console. He says, I'm just going to get all of the data, put it into Excel, and then I can work my magic. So he sits down. He writes a query, select star from store. So. <laughs> All right, so from your laughs, I can tell that you know the ramification of this, right? This query is going over several years of data, several regions, and it's just dominating this, uh, this cluster. And at the time, if, if that query is taking over the cluster, our ETL jobs can't pull in new data, right? They don't have the resources. So resource contention was a serious issue we were having. And we couldn't just create new clusters because we were blocked by our infrastructure team. So this is what um, the, this is essentially how things looked. We were pulling things into HDFS from the different data centers. And what I really want to point out here, uh, that this will take account later in the story, is that we were pulling data in through uh, like individual columns. So what I mean by that is we're creating a data lake such that there is a one-to-one -one column uh, ex existence, I guess, between the source tables and the destination tables. Now, what happened after this is, right, we have our full data center, and someone had the genius idea, hey, why don't we collect even more data? And this is where we started collecting the telemetry data from the servers, so error logs and things like that. But at that point, we had the foresight. We knew it wouldn't fit into this cluster, so we already put that into Amazon S3. So all of the server telemetry, we built this tool to ingest all of the server telemetry from all, uh, several different applications across our enterprise, and that was getting stored in S3. But what, I, what you might notice is that the format of the data is completely different from how the transactional data is stored. So for the server telemetry, we actually decided to store it in a map column. So now let me take a quick aside from the story of how we got to the cloud to talk about the map column type. So the map column type allows you to have keys and values in a single column in Hive. And the problem with this is that it slows performance down, because Hive can't build indexes on that as well as it could on an individual column. But the advantage is that when you have a map structure, if you add a new column to a source table, all you have to do is add a new key and a value in that record, right? And this has been super valuable for us, because we have a lot of upstream changes. So if you have 15 different environments and you have new champions coming out and new game modes and things like that, then just modifying your data warehouse and adding columns is a job in itself. So we found a lot of value in this. So what our target goal was, was to move this data to the same location so we could join it, right? Half of our data was in our data center in HDFS, and the other half was in the cloud in S3. And if you wanted to run a query, like how does latency affect the win rates of our players, that wasn't really something that was easily done. So we wanted to move toward an architecture that was much more similar to this, right? Uh, you'll notice that the transactional data is now converted to the map format and everything is stored in the same place. So we came up with this project plan. We're going to move everything over to the cloud so that it all works great. 
But as you can probably assume from this title and what I said before, it didn't go perfectly. So let me talk about the first attempt. And actually, I have a question for you. So here's, here's what our project entailed, right? We wanted to first create a new uh, EMR cluster that can handle the ETLs from uh, all of our transactional data in the data centers. Uh, we wanted to create a new cluster for all of our user accounts so that the ETL jobs and the user queries didn't conflict with each other. Um, and we also had the telemetry EMR uh, cluster that was already there, right? Like I mentioned, that was already in S3. So we can use the meta store that already exists for the telemetry store and just point the new uh, data to use that meta store. So uh, underneath of that, right, we have a standard hive uh, structure where we have different databases or schemas, and underneath of those are tables with uh, different partitions. A majority of our tables are partitioned by uh, what environment they're coming from, so Korea or NA, and then some date partition, right? Uh, the, da the date partition varies in size depending on how big the table is. So uh, underneath of this, uh, Hive is storing all of the actual data files into HDFS in a very similar structure of nested folders. So you had the parent uh, schema folder, the parent tables folder, and then so forth and so on until you get to the uh, data files themselves. And what we wanted to migrate this to is S3, right? So we're gonna keep the very similar nested directory structure but we're gonna store it in an S3 bucket instead of HDFS. As so you see, the gray part down there at the bottom is all the telemetry data, which is already there. And that's why it's grayed out, because we don't care about it, it's already good. Uh, so, uh, I wanna ask you guys a question. If you were the project manager for this task, given the fact that you're moving about 60 terabytes of data, right, you're creating two EMR clusters, and then you're converting some of the data to this new map format, how much time would you allocate for this project? Right, six months, six months to a year, or a year? Uh, teams like 18 people, maybe 10 to 18 people growing. <laughs> six months? So we, we thought it would take less than six, six months, right? All we're doing is copying a bunch of files to another location. Uh, but it actually ended up taking us over a year uh, because of some mistakes that we made. <laughs> so hopefully you can learn from those mistakes. But uh, during that time, we were also working on other projects as well. So it wasn't like we were just doing this. We had you know, emergent tickets from our analysts. We had uh, this concept of playing around with a new real-time system and things like that. But the reason that we thought we could do it in less than six months was because we are gung-ho about Hive. And we're like, Hive is this awesome tool, right? You can point tables at different storage locations. So all we really need to do is point a table at the new S3 storage location and then write all of the ta data from that source table into that new table. And it will just do everything magically underneath it there. And so that was what our first project was, right? Um, the first thing we did, right, we wanted to cr find a cutoff date. So uh, the, we have the ETLs pointed at both the source and the destination um, data warehouses so that new data is coming in, and then at that cutoff point, we're going to backload everything before there. And we're going to assume that those ETLs are loading data correctly. Once we have that date, we'll copy all of the files before that cutoff date and move it to S3. And then we're gonna do the map conversion, right? So this is where we use Hive and we say, let's make a temporary table. We're gonna convert everything to the map format. And then we're gonna, once it's in the map format, copy it and put it back in production. Uh, the one thing I wanna call out here is that uh, this cutover date is really, really useful to have, right? Because when you uh, have your ETLs loading in both locations, 
if something goes wrong in your migration, you can always tell your users to go back to the original source, right? It's not like you're moving all the new data over to this location. So if something goes wrong, they still have up-to-date data that they can fall back on. So here's a wall of text, right, of what our scripts look like. And I had to do a little bit of code archaeology to get this code, because uh, this was checked in around 2011 in GitHub, so <laughs> had to dig deep. But uh, really, the first line is just using the dist cp um, tool that comes with Hadoop to copy the files to S3, and you notice that we're storing the output into a log. Uh, then we uh, create this new temporary table, and we copy all of the data over from the production table, but we cast the, the data into this map format. And then finally, once all of the data is converted to the map format, we move it back to production. <coughs> Great. So we got this script, but we have 70 tables and 15 regions to move. So instead of customizing each table and each environment and rewriting this, we created a Python script to automatically generate it. Then we put those scripts on several different boxes, and we ran it in parallel. Uh, after a week or so, we logged in, we scanned our, our, our log files, didn't see any errors, everything was great, right? We're done, talk is over, thank you very much. Uh, except for it wasn't, right? So uh, we, we told our customers, here you go, here's the new cloud structure, you can join your data, you can do all this cool new stuff, and uh, what happened was uh, not as desirable. So we had missing partitions, we had corrupted partitions, and when the analysts finally got their hands on the cloud hive, they were waiting really long time to run their queries. So this is disheartening. <laughs> And, but one of the cool things about Riot is uh, we're forgiving of our mistakes, and we rebooted, we retroed, and we tried to learn things so it could move forward and serve our analysts better. So uh, what we did like out of our first attempt was the disk CP tool. It was very quick, very easy to use. Um, but what we didn't like was when we were using Hive uh, 08 to convert things to the map format. So uh, what we discovered was there were several bugs, specifically with this version of Hive, that are JIRA tickets that you can go look up if you, you're really curious, uh, with the insert overwrite command, where uh, you would p potentially get duplicates and uh, potentially get partial loads, and it would fail silently. Uh, so, from that whole experience, we also learned that we need to make sure that every file gets copied and converted exactly, and we need to audit after that whole process is done. And this was a big missing thing in our first product, uh, pro first approach, right? So, if you're thinking about moving, consider auditing as part of your plan. Um, don't underestimate simple problems in big data. Uh, so we thought this would be six weeks. Uh, this is really targeted for the project managers out there. Uh, even though you're moving files, moving 1.4 files can add significant complexity. So anything at scale can be more complex than what you would expect. Um, part of the reason that our analysts were struggling with performance is we, because we didn't allocate enough time to do performance tuning in our AWS infrastructure. So there are a lot of different variables that go into creating an optimal performance for these queries, such as you, uh, your Hive configuration for memory usage in your instances, the instance size themselves, networking and security configuration, and things like that. And we didn't really do that. We just clicked the start EMR button. Um, and finally, like, lost trust is hard to gain. So after we delivered this to our analysts, they didn't want to touch or look at CloudHive for the next year and a half until we could provide them solid evidence that we had matched the, uh, everything and fixed, fixed all of the problems. All right.
So back to our problem, right? We have this data warehouse now. It's in the cloud, but it has holes all over. It's like Swiss cheese. So if you were in our position, what would your approach be to resolving this situation, right? Would you fix the holes and keep the good data? Or would you just wipe everything out and start from scratch? So we, even though we were frustrated and wanted to move to the woods and give up, we uh, decided to fix the holes, right? We have a good set amount of, good, of data in there. Let's just go through, find the bad data, and fix it. So that brings us to our second attempt. But this time, we took it more seriously, like a real project. <laughs> so we thought about it, and we did some analysis to try and figure out how long things would take. And what we, well, our approach to solving these bad uh, partitions was to leverage our ETL tool. So the ETL tool is pretty cool because uh, it can, you can write one uh, ETL task that can pull across all 15 different environments and 15 different tables and combine it into one location. It's also cool because it's idempotent. And so if there's ever a situation where the ETL is running twice on the same data, it will ensure that you don't have duplication. So we felt this would be a safer approach to solving all these gaps. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to go through and compare the row counts in Iron Hive, uh, our, data center, Iron, uh, our data center version of, of Hive, and uh, compare the row counts from that with the row counts in Cloud Hive. Any time they didn't match, then we needed to load that data. So this is sort of what that looked like. We pulled all of the row counts and stored them into a database for our personal analysis. We just run queries to figure out what, what partitions were bad. And what we found was that we had a lot of bad partitions. So, this is just data from 2013 forward, from January. But uh, since January 2013 forward, we had a total of 40,000 bad partitions. And uh, so we, we decided, OK, how long is this project going to take to complete? Right. Well, using the ETL tool, it takes 10 seconds to fix duplicate uh, partitions. It takes 10 minutes to fix partitions where there's missing data. and so. Uh, calculating the number of partitions and the time it takes to run each one, how long is this project going to take? The problem was that just figuring out what was broken took a long time. Right? We had Hive 08, it was very, very immature, and we didn't have statistics enabled on our tables, which means that every time you want to do select count star to get the row counts for your partition, it actually has to run a map reduce job. It can't just pull that data from the Metastore. So uh, finding the bad partitions is very expensive. But once we found them all, right, we figured that the amount of time it would take to repair 40,000 uh, bad partitions would be about 266 days of consecutive compute time. Uh, for all time, since 2009, 787 days. Now. Uh, you can imagine the face that our manager made when, we saw, when he saw these numbers, right? <laughs> this is not going to happen, right? We're going to pull in new data before all of this is done. So plan B is the worst, right? We had to regroup and figure out another solution. So we did. We retroed again. Um, and we, we did find value in like honestly calculating how long any type of migration like this would move. And this is important information that you need when you're making this decision to, to allocate resources and things like that. Um, and extrapolation seemed to be a, a good rough estimate of doing this. Um, but uh, as you can imagine by now, uh, really repairing in, in certain situations is going to be a lot slower than actually wiping things out and starting again. And so in our third try, right, we wiped things out and started again <laughs> because we learned that it, it's much faster. So, but I mean, this is a, a decision that you will have to make. Hopefully when you copy your data, you won't have 
any errors at all. And if you do, it'll be one partition, and you probably don't want to start from scratch in that situation. Uh, turn row count statistics on Hive uh, if you don't have them on already. This is just standard, general, nice thing to have. Uh, don't assume your data warehouse is 100% uh, accurate. So while we were going through and doing the comparison of our data center, um, our data center row counts and our cloud hive row counts, we actually found some situations where our data center ETLs were breaking. So uh, that figuring out and debugging that was also another time sink for our team when we were going through there. Um, so in order to solve that problem, right, uh, make sure that your team has some sort of auditing solution. You want to be able to compare the source data, so the actual tables from the data centers around the world or whatever your ecosystem is. Those source tables, you want to be able to compare the row counts of uh, that and what's in your data warehouse. Okay, so finally, third attempt, right? We're getting there. We're, we're, we're making mistakes left and right, but each time we're stronger, we're gaining knowledge. So we start from scratch, right? And we knew that the disk CP tool was solid from our first try, so we go back to using that. But what's missing is this auditing feature. So we wanted to customize the disk CP tool a little bit to make sure that everything that gets copied is done correctly. So uh, that's actually what we did. We, we modified some of the code in the disk CP uh, uh, jars, and we changed it so it would be a data-driven tool. So it recursively listed all of the files in our HDFS uh, data center, and it saved them into a database. So once, once they're in that database, we can use it for auditing, tracking, and retrying if something fails. So what, oh, Whoop. So what that table looked like was um, on your far left, you have a application ID, which uh, links to the MapReduce job that you're running to copy the data. You have uh, your source location of the file. You have your target location of the file, uh, source file size, target file size, source checksum, target checksum and then the statuses of where each file is in the process of getting moved to uh, the cloud. So what we did was we, we had our database table full of all of the files and we just loop through them, we copy them from uh, HDFS to S3 and then we check the file size match and that the checksums match after they've been copied. If something goes wrong, then we store that uh, there's a failure status in the table. If something goes right, then it continues on to the next row and moves that file. So uh, the, right, all the failed files after that can just be rerun until you get things working, um, and then you're good to go. So that's, this is an example of the same time, table after everything has run and executed. So you'll notice the highlighted uh, uh, rows are two rows that have failed moving. So the first one failed because for some reason it didn't copy, right? Maybe the, uh, the MapReduce job ran out of memory because the file was so big, uh, which happened to us several times. Maybe the uh, network had a blip, something like that. Uh, but you can debug what the issue was by looking at the application job ID in the MapReduce logs. And then the other one just didn't match the checksums. So you can see the underlying checksums don't match. So after this, we have a list of all the files. We know that they match one to one. And so at this point, right, we can use Hive to do our conversion, but we're at a newer version of Hive, so those bugs don't exist. And we have our auditing tool so we can make sure that everything is working correctly. So at this point, we're confident of our data warehouse in the cloud. Uh, throughout this whole process, we're doing performance improvements on the AWS infrastructure and the Hive sites, things like that. So uh, we retroed again, but this was a happier retro. <laughs> um, 
first off, right, thing that worked great for us was making sure that this migration tool or your migration process is repeatable. Because you think that you're moving your data, where, data to the warehouse once, but there may be a situation where you want to move it again or to a different place or something doesn't go right, so you need to retry. Um, part of uh, the work that we did when we were customizing the disk CP tool was making sure that the API calls to S3 matched. So we had Hive.08, and at that point, the uh, S3 APIs had changed so much that the disk CP copy tool didn't actually work. So we actually had to go in and make some changes to that. So don't wait too long to migrate or else disk CP might have some issues and you'll have to address those. Um, create S3 permissions and naming standards early. Uh, for anyone doing anything in S3, this is important because you don't wanna have multiple different files that are the same thing or the same name that are different files or weird things like that. And you wanna make sure that people can't delete your S3 environment. Because one of the things about AWS is it empowers all of us to do more, and that can sometimes be a double-bladed sword. Sword. <laughs> uh, right, don't forget to clean up your S3 files after you're done moving, <laughs> which we still have to do. Um, uh, upgrade your Hive version to more stable releases. This was, uh, I'm, I'm just not a fan of Hive 08. Uh, being a developer who has spent serious time uh, digging into why these things aren't matching and then just finding out it's a bug with Hive has been a very frustrating system. So uh, upgrading Hive uh, to newer versions is a relatively easy process and uh, I encourage you to do that. Uh, hire people smarter than yourself. So what this really bullet point really is about is that while we were making this move to AWS, we were learning ourselves, right? And uh, it would have gone a lot smoother had we had an AWS expert in-house right away. And part of what made this third attempt so successful is because we hired an AWS expert. So, uh, I, I realize this isn't an easy bullet point, right? Everyone's having a hard time trying to find the big data experts, but this is important. Uh, and finally, don't stop believing. Uh, I think that uh, you know, after so many attempts to get this data to the cloud, we finally did it. Uh, it was, there were times where we lost our morale and things didn't go great, but we finally did it. Also, I was tired and I wanted to put something funny in here. All right, cool. So, all of our data is in the data warehouse now. We have this cool tool that can move it again if we need to. So I wanna tell you a little bit, a little story. Uh, right after we got our data into the data warehouse and everything's going great, one of our engineers comes in, really smart guy, logs in, sees uh, does a show schemas in Hive and sees this collection of databases. So what looks weird about this? <laughs> right. What would you do if you see, see these delete me ones? Right. Man, they're kind of an eyesore. Someone must think it's safe to delete. So let's just delete them, right? And that's what our guy did. But... Oops, uh, he deleted a significant part of the data warehouse that we had just worked so hard to get there. And how this happened was these specific uh, schemas were being part of the, the move process. And once we had finished moving, we decided we didn't need them anymore. The problem is these are all managed tables. And when he deleted them, he did cascade delete. So if you are doing cascade delete on managed tables, that means you remove the underlying data. And it was pointed at our production data. So the lesson here really is, even if something's named delete me one, make sure that you go in and check that 
where the tables are pointed before you delete it. And make sure you talk to your team and make sure everything is uh, kosher before deleting it. Uh, also, uh, one thing that we found was you may want to think about turning on S3 versioning once your data is there. S3 versioning will make a copy of your existing data so that if a situation does occur like that, then you can use S3 uh, versioning to restore it. So now that I've gone through, we finally uh, unlocked the potential that AWS has. We, we, we have all of our data co-located in one place. And what can we do from a technological perspective now? So just a reminder, this is what our ecosystem looked like around uh, December this year. We finally got everything up and running. Uh, the ETLs pulling it, uh, data from the transactional data, uh, from the transactional tables into our data warehouse, uh, and everything's going great. Uh, but because uh, AWS frees us to, to, from a lot of the sort of infrastructure overhead, we've been able to grow our infrastructure in just eight months to do a lot more things for our customers and our players. Um, so for compute, we use uh, Amazon EMR and EC2. And you'll see we have uh, individual clusters for each of our uh, key stakeholders. So data science has their own cluster. Analytics has their cl own cluster. So instead of them stepping on each, other, each other's feet, they can uh, be in charge of their own domain. Uh, we are able to get real-time ingestion working, so we have a cluster for that. We have our ETL cluster plugging away. Uh, Platfora is our visualization tool that we use uh, across Hive, and that spins up and shuts down clusters left and right. Um, and then we have another cluster for loading data into DynamoDB, and I'll get to that in a second. Overall, across uh, EMR and EC2, we have about 750 instances running and uh, computing and crunching data. So all that data that we crunch gets stored into various different locations. Uh, I talked a bunch today about S3 and our Metastore, which is an RDS. But uh, RDS also enables us to uh, create storage for our other customers. Uh, and uh, we're also using DynamoDB to do quick point lookups. And we say, feel safe with all of this ecosystem uh, in the cloud because we have some pretty solid protection with uh, AWS sort of networking and security stuff. So all of this is behind a, a VPC uh, to make sure uh, naughty people can't get into it and see all of our secrets. And uh, we, we also are uh, using AWS Direct Connect so that we can ensure that the pipes between our data warehouse in the cloud and our pipes between, or, and uh, the individual data centers around the world are clear and uncongested. So uh, yeah, from a technological perspective, this new infrastructure has given us a lot of opportunities. So uh, like, like the story I told you before about our young, uh, bright-eyed analyst taking over everything, uh, we can now avoid that situation by just spinning up his own EMR cluster if it actually requires that level of computation. Uh, as you saw in the previous slide, we have clusters set up for the data science team, the analytics team. And one of the nice things is we can get billing and associate it with each one of those teams for based on the resources that they're using. So before in a data center, how do you divide one cluster across all those different people? It's tricky. <laughs> I, I wouldn't know how to do it. Uh, and then, you know, the, there are other products like CloudWatch monitoring, built-in monitoring that make our lives easier just to, if something breaks, we can catch it. Um, so when we moved, we moved 1.4 million partitions of data to the cloud, right? And the telemetry data already existed there. And today, we have 27 million partitions of data in our data warehouse. So uh, 
we need a good solution for vertical scaling. And I think that a lot of people here at this conference will talk a lot about horizontal scaling, but one of the nice features of RDS is that it's really easy to upgrade one of your database instances. To, to go from 1.4 million partitions to 27 million partitions, if you were in a data center, you would have to shut everything down, rack a new server, back up the database, transfer that backup over to the new server and spin it up. And with AWS, we just push a button. Uh, and, and really, a lot of the sort of administrative tasks like managing uh, like job task processes and name node processes has been abstracted away by S3 and EMR so that it frees our team to build that infrastructure within the series of, uh, within, within eight months. Uh, finally, uh, if you ever had a situation where you have to go in and debug hardware, uh, you can just reboot the instance. <laughs> So that's more time on your hands to play League of Legends. <laughs> so all of this tech has really translated into uh, some great tools for us to make our players have a better experience overall. Uh, one of these uh, is a new feature to our game. Uh, if anyone in the audience plays League of Legends, you might be familiar with this new feature. Uh, it's called Champion Mastery. And how it works is the more you play a game, the more that you level up f with that champion. So you can compare your skill level of the champion to the skill levels of other people who play that champion. And this is a really intensive query that was running that spanned every game across all time um, and was a lot of data. Uh, but the value that it really brings is this new game mode that really uh, improves our uh, player engagement and keeps people coming back to play more. So this is not something we would have been able to do with our data center. So uh, the query would have taken everything over and no one else would have been able to do work during the two or three days that it ran. Uh, the next story I wanna tell you is uh, about our player support team. So our player support team, uh, they're the guys in the front line answering all of the questions like, I bought this item, but it's not appearing in my inventory. What's up, Rito? Um, so the, the situation they were having is they would log into their player support tool and they would look up that player to make sure that he actually bought it and he isn't just lying to get free stuff. And they would sit there for 15 minutes waiting for the data to load. So the player support tool needs to get every, all of the information about that player, such as their purchases, last time they logged in, to be able to handle a, a, a large number of different questions. And the reason this was happening was because they were using the wrong backend database. They were using Vertica, which is a great tool for columnar aggregation and analysis, but it's uh, not used for looking up a single row and a single player. So what we did was we decided to leverage DynamoDB to increase that performance. But in order to do that, we had to get all the data into DynamoDB. So we used uh, uh, DynamoDB dynamic partitions in Hive, which is a feature that's specific to EMR. And uh, we copied the entire data warehouse in our cloud to, and put it into DynamoDB. So now, what once took 15 minutes for that support person to help answer that player's question, they could query that data within a second. So uh, if you are uh, thinking about something like this, right, if you have a situation where your team is querying data and you need a fast response time, you need to be able to have different types of sort of access patterns to get that data out of your data warehouse. And because uh, AWS is so easy to build our own infrastructure, we've been empowered to do that. And finally, uh, chat detection. So there's an unfortunate fact that uh, there's a minority of players in the gaming community that uh, ha have kind of rough language 
<laughs> to put delicately. Um, some of these people are just negative. Some are just having a rough day because they're working hard uh, and they keep losing games. But Riot wants to help uh, improve the environment that our players uh, have, make it a safe environment. So uh, our data science team had come up with this way of classifying our chat logs to determine whether there was you know, negative things being said or racist things, things like that. And uh, they had a series of uh, sentiment analysis and classification algorithms that they were running on their laptop. Now, this is silly, right? Because you're loading a huge model in, on a laptop. If something dies or you run out of memory, uh, you're going to have a bad time. So uh, with EC2, we are able to spin up a, a Spark cluster. I think specifically we're using uh, Databricks uh, data science platform which gives them free reign to run these things and sort of optimize uh, queries for uh, detection. And, and since this has been in place, uh, our players have b f had a safer environment to play in and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're almost done. Uh, I just want to wrap up by saying that uh, over the course of this talk, I described the many mistakes that we've made to, in this process. And part of it is because the, the ecosystem, the, the environment, the big data is happening is fresh and young, right? Uh, building a big data platform is like building a castle on shifting sands. Because throughout this whole process, we had new versions of Hive come out, new versions of Amazon EMR, AMIs coming out, um, and all sorts of different changing, like people were solidifying their concepts around uh, cloud architecture and things like that. So we're, we're, we're in a good time now because these products are maturing. We can, we can learn from our mistakes from the past, and then we can deliver this awesome player value to uh, our customers or our players, for those of you who are in the gaming industry. So um, with that being said, uh, I want to wrap up. Uh, thank you for attending. Um, so let me do a quick plug for our brand new engineering blog. Uh, there's some really cool information that you guys might find on there, uh, including how our store and merchandise team ha sets up their AWS infrastructure. Uh, or if you're more into the like nitty gritty details of game design, uh, there's like vector programming tutorials and things like that. And uh, this talk and more details will make it onto there soon, TM. Um, after this, uh, later tonight, right, it, Wednesday is party night. So there's the AWS bar crawl at 5.30. And once you're done at the bar crawl, keep the party going with us. Uh, we're hosting an after party at uh, 6 tonight uh, at the Palazzo Tower, um, third floor. So uh, if you're interested in that, come up. I have some invitations. And then finally, if you have any questions that we don't have time to get to, uh, feel free to add me on Twitter or send me an email. I'm happy to get in much more depth than what I got in today and help you guys out, because we're all one big happy family. Uh, so with that being said, uh, thank you for your time and stuff. <laughs>